It's another beautiful day in Portland. What better time to do a micro front end video than right now? Uh, in this one, we're going to do a high level overview of micro front ends. We're not gonna dig down into the bits and bites, which is what we normally do in the you can check out that playlist. It's got a whole bunch of videos about how to do the bits and the bytes of micro front ends. In this one, we're just gonna talk about what micro front ends are, why they're interesting, what some potential disadvantages are, and then finally, the process for how to take an existing website and turn it into a micro front end based website. So what is a micro front end? Well, a micro front end is the just code for a portion of a web page. It's not the whole page, it's just a portion of the web page. And in that model, the web page hosting that component, we call the host page. There's also a micro front end framework that sits between the host page and the micro front ends that manages loading and unloading those micro front ends and any other contractual work to get the micro front ends to work. So there's three key pieces to the micro front end architecture, and that would be the micro front ends, the micro front end framework, and the host pages. So let's take a look at this amazon.com webpage and see if there's any user interface elements that we can identify as micro front end potential targets. And I'm seeing these little panels, and I think those would be really good for this. They're pretty much self-contained. The user interface isn't littered all over the page. Um, and it seems like they're set up already to do that kind of micro front end work. So I believe those would be good micro front end targets. Um, also, the header and the footer of most conventional pages is a great micro front end because that's something you're going to want to share between pages. So let's talk about some advantages when it comes to micro front ends. Let's get the good stuff out of the way <laughs> before we talk about the bad stuff. Uh, the first big advantage is just team scalability. You're going to have more people able to work on a given web page because those micro front ends are versioned and in, in, uh, independently deployed. So each one of those would be its own project. And then the micro front end would go off onto S3 and then be loaded by the page. So that micro front end team can work independently of the host page team. And that can be deployed even if the host page isn't deploying it, which it makes it how uh, which makes a, a micro front end different from a library. So the next big advantage kind of builds on that. It allows the uh, host page team to be more of a platform team focused on uh, long range deliverables, contracts, how to manage the performance of the site, how analytics can be routed, that kind of stuff. And then your uh, MFE teams are based on tactical delivery that's more customer centric. They're, you know, interested in like, how do I go and tweak this interface so it's more, you know, it's going to convert better and it's going to look better and it's going to engage the customer better. And that's great. So now both of those teams can uh, work 100% on their particular area, right? Your host page team is going to be able to 100% concentrate on making a great host page. And your uh, MFE tactical teams are going to be 100% engaged around what's going to make uh, a better conversion, what's going to get more customer engagement. Uh, as opposed to having one page that it's kind of gets bounced back and forth between, okay, with this sprint, we're going to do more infrastructural work. And in this sprint, we're going to do more uh, customer focused work. And you have uh, team members that are kind of bouncing back and forth skill set wise in both of those areas. So that's really good. Um, another key element is reuse, right? We're going to be able to go and take those little Amazon panels and reuse them wherever we want to, as long as those host pages conform to that MFE standard which is awesome. Imagine if you've got a, a really cool product carousel on the home page and you want to be able to reuse it on a product detail page or on a search page. In this model, that's, that's easy to do. So as long as everybody's conforming to that MFE standard. And the fourth key benefit is technology agnosticism, meaning that you can have a host page that's written in Vue or React or Svelte or whatever, uh, as long as it maintains that MFE standard and those contracts, then any MFE is going to be able to work on that page, which is phenomenal. And also uh, the MFEs themselves. 
right? If your carousel isn't particularly complex and you can get away with just doing vanilla JavaScript and make for a much smaller JavaScript payload to go to the customer, go do it, man. That's great. And that's fantastic. And it opens up a lot of innovation doors for your engineers. All right. Now, this all sounds really great. What are some potential downsides? Why would you not want to do this? Well, the primary one is around complexity. It's just a more complex system, right? In a traditional model, you're going to have a project, and it's going to get built into a Dockerized container, probably, and then get EDE tested to make sure that it passes everything, and then get deployed. And that's that's great. You know, you can go home, you can flip burgers, and you know, hey, man, the site's working. As long as the servers are up, it's all good. Uh, in this model, though, you're going to have a host page, and it's going to be dynamically loading stuff from other teams, and those teams may mess up and may take down the page. JavaScript is a single-threaded execution model. It's not particularly sandboxed. It's not really sandboxed at all. So uh, it's very likely that you're going to get runtime issues that you didn't expect, where the team is expecting a different runtime environment than what they got, different message formats than what they got, uh, and you're going to run into issues. And when you get your first P0, you're going to be pulling out your hair like, why did we do this to ourselves? And, uh, and that's when you're going to be like, well, let's go back and look at those advantages and just remind ourselves that like this is allowing more people to be able to engage in building the site without stepping on each other's toes and the reuse and all the rest of it. Uh, another problem is that there is currently no standards in this space. So uh, there are a bunch of micro front end frameworks out there already. There's open components, there's single spa, there's Taylor, there's one from eBay that does uh, iframe based components. Basically, any big corporation uh, will go and build one of these for themselves and be like, oh, that's a great thing to open source. Let's go open source that. And they'll go off and open source it. And if it works for you, that's great. If not, then hmm. But there's no standard. There's no winner. There's no current like redux in the MFE space. And honestly, I don't think there's probably ever going to be because uh, site to site, there's going to be such variability in the requirements that I don't think that that's realistic. Okay, so let's talk about the process. So project management wise, how are you going to go get from where you're at today with a website to a micro front end based website? Well, the first thing to do is go and do what we did with that Amazon.com page and go and look for MFE targets, right? What are the pieces of functionality that we want to turn into MFEs and then be able to reuse all over the site? Uh, and it should be a diverse set that shows different interaction models, uh, maybe different data requirements, uh, some things loaded on the client and need to be loaded on the client, some things can be loaded on the server, you know, just get a diversity there so that as you're going into the next phase, which is developing the set of requirements, uh, you're gonna know everything that you're gonna want from an MFE framework. And that, you know, so you gotta figure out, when do you want to go and render these things? What are their data requirements? Do they need to talk to each other? Do they need to talk to the host page? Do they need to talk to the header? Do they need to talk? What do they need to do? And once you get all that sorted out, once you get those requirements captured, you can go on to the next phase, which would be the evaluation of the tools that exist already. So you can look at those OSS tools that are out there already. I've got a handy uh, playlist with a bunch of them. Um, and then also evaluate... If, you, if none of those fit, then uh, start designing your DIY framework. But the great thing is now you've got those requirements captured so you know what you need from the framework that you're going to go build. Well, I hope this video is valuable to you in terms of presenting kind of a high-level based uh, pros and cons of the MicroFE architecture. And uh, if it was, then please like it. If you have any more questions or comments, feel free to leave those down below. I'm always a big fan of my subscribers. And if you want to keep up to date with all things micro FE and uh, just advanced FE in general, feel free to ring that bell and get notifications whenever I upload a new video. And of course, just be good to each other. <laughs>